That Davis show, lucky enough to be joined from the Athletic Chicago White Sox writer James Fegan. Follow him at JR Fegan. How are you doing, James? Good, and you? I'm doing all right. You know what? I'm doing better than I was feeling yesterday. I was <laughs> same. Yeah, I'm doing, and it's it's so funny because like Cubs fans and people are reaching out to me like, "What's going on over there? Why is it that no one's happy?" And I'm I'm trying to explain that to them exactly how I feel and how some people feel. So okay, so we all know that Tony Russa, Hall of Fame manager, was announced as a new White Sox manager yesterday. All right, and I find myself in discussions trying to tell people how I feel. And then I'd leave it alone because sometimes it feels like you're not trying to listen to how I felt. So you came in yesterday and asked a question uh, during the presser about the Colin Kaepernick situation, which I think a lot of us, especially people of color, kind of bothers us. And some people will kind of be like, get over it. But and you you kind of told me why you you asked that question. But initially, so let everybody else know, why was that your first question? If anything, James was the, ser- the second or first person to, to talk to Tony and Rick Hahn. Well, yeah, like, so like a normal Rick Hahn presser, like maybe during the middle of the season, especially because they kind of happen every couple of weeks, I'll have like a Google Doc that I have open um, that I'm just like making notes on stuff that I would talk to the next time I talk to the GM, stuff like that. So a, a normal presser that could get to 15, 20 items and maybe like half of them will get addressed. Maybe someone will get asked by other people. Kind of knowing that this was going to be a bigger thing and uh, there'd be a lot of interest in. I had like five items on there. Like I really, and, and knowing how Zoom conference conference calls have gone, it's really it's not asking one question, a bunch of follow ups, or it's not um, an opportunity where as long as you're just kind of in a conversation with the you know the guy at that point, you can kind of keep going for a little bit. It's really ask one question, get out. So I, I was really at the point of thinking um, that at that point in time. I might get, there was like 65 people in the Zoom call, which is, you know, normally during the season, maybe the playoffs, there was like 30 people in the Zoom call. So I, I thought there'd be, you know, and it wound up being, I asked two questions the entire time. And that was probably twice as many as most people got. <laughs> so I thought like, what question, I think there was, a, I talked to another reporter that we were both like on the same wavelength that that was something that needed to be brought up at some point. Um, I, my initial approach was let me kind of lay in wait uh, let me get the lay of how this is going to go, <laughs> and uh, you know I'll ask it when I get called up. But I got called up pretty early. I think that's a function of you know being on the beat and you get called first, even though I wasn't like the first person to raise my hand. Um, and I thought like, well, I'm, I would res- I would really hate it, and it would be a disservice to our job if this was not something that was asked um, before I left. So it being one of my basically only question I asked only Ruse the whole time, I, I felt it needed to be addressed and. You know, we talk about it as something that bothers us, and I think that's very pertinent. And I think you know, you know, the White Sox, the city of Chicago, it's, it's a as much as it's privately owned franchise, it is somewhat of a civic institution. The city of Chicago, you know, the people, what reason why people root for a team is because they feel like it's representing them and their city and their populace. That's important, but just on a tactical basis of winning games. Five, you know, they just declined uh, Edwin Encarnacion's option. So, you know, Edwin kneeled for the anthem for the start of the season, but now he, that's, cool. uh, he's gone. But there are five players that Tony La Russa will manage uh, next season who kneeled for the anthem at the start of the season. So as being somebody who had been outspoken and saying it was disrespectful and the wrong way to protest, I wanted to know how are you going to build this relationship of trust and that show these guys that you respect their voice and their um, – decision to speak out and that you're not going to make them feel silenced or, um, you know, discouraged from expressing their opinion. Uh, how are you going to bridge that gap and, and build that relationship? And, you know, it's not even just like, it was just five players who did it. It was arguably the five best players on the team. Like not that it shouldn't matter, but <laughs> it'd be one thing if like, you know, five loogies in the bullpen all sat right. down, put down on knee, but that's not what happened. Like, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, building trust with the core of this team without kind of tackling that. And, you know, I think Tony was very clearly um, prepared for that. Mm-hmm. And he definitely, I would say, I, I think the way I wrote it was that the answers were not perfect. Um, they were not like a total, you know, I, 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 you have to respect their experience and you have to, uh, you know, give 
deference to where they're coming from with their decision to protest and, you know, full sympathy and support of, you know, the causes that they're pushing against. It was more, this was a guy who had just doubled down on this position twice publicly and was kind of clearly trying to move towards a position of being more accepting of it, but wasn't there yet. And I would say it's encouraging of an idea that he was not digging in his heels further and doubling down and was cognizant of the fact that there's a relationship he needs to start building. But I think for people who are like, why would you hire this guy who has this bridge he needs to build? It, it would not fully dismiss that concern. And also it, the way he answered in terms of he's gained a greater appreciation of it because he now sees that there's sincerity behind it and there's actual real um, you know, activism behind it. Oof. Why? Why is there a litmus test that you know he is able to put on that you know they have to clear for it to be respected? I I, I think that'd be you know a worthy question and and uh, you know something he's still not necessarily succeeding in. Um, but at the same time, and I'm following up on it as we speak, is that he said he spoke to the Players Alliance. Um, he said you know Bruce Maxwell, you know the first baseball player who who kneeled for the anthem back in 2017. Um, mm -hmm you know, spoke on Twitter and I, I've talked to his people and they said that, you know, Tony was very active in getting him uh, back into to baseball after baseball. he was, you know, effectively yeah, blackball. Yeah. So there's definitely people who are, who are out there who are speaking up and saying that, you know, Tony is um, aware of systemic racism and he's not just purely trying to couch his lack of sympathy for it in that he objects to the way it was protested which I think is probably what we rightly suspect whenever anybody kind of speaks out on it and says that the kneeling is wrong is really, they just don't want to hear about it. And right. there's no medium that they would really be happy about. I don't, I still don't agree with that position that, you know, if you really cared about these causes that you would get that hung up on the, on the medium, but, you know, looking more into it and, and calling people these past couple of days, I, it does seem like he wants to contribute to, to anti-racism, that he does have some, uh, you know, instances where he showed some allyship in that regard. It's not perfect, but I think that he's on the path a little bit. It's just, do you want to turn over your ready-made contender franchise to somebody who's on the path, but not there? Especially when you have such a large African component on this team. He's necessarily the guy. That David show, talking to James Fegan from the Athletic Chicago, follow him at J.R. Fegan. It was funny. I was watching MLB Now, and they were like, when, they, when the interview first started, and after the interview ended, or they cut for, away from it, they were like, wow, the reporters really went at them. What's going on? <laughs> it was like they were just amazed. They were like, why, why isn't everybody happy? And it, it, it kind of just speaks to – two different Americas in a way, because kind of what I open with trying to talk to people and everyone, some people are telling me like, man, you got a great manager. And it's like, yeah, I get that part. And that's not taking in the fact that he's been away as far as being down in the dugout for an extended amount of time, but still, I, mean, I was an AJ Hinch guy, but still it's the fact of what took place with the Colin Kaepernick thing. Uh, I want to ask you this, James, because one of the things that you mentioned and one of the things that Tony Russo pointed out was that one thing he enjoys now when he sees uh, the social justice movement by these players is that the sincerity and their, their action afterwards. And it felt like a slap in the face because to me, and you you brought up the Maxwell situation, which I didn't I didn't know about, and I was just watching three three months ago uh, something on ESPN about how how he was out there really bad, and how he finally got back in, and how his manager or his agent really took care of him during that period of time. So that's fantastic. I'm happy Tony Russo had something to do with it. But to hear him say that the sincerity, and yet he had not, had not come out and uh, basically pivoted away from what he had said in 2016 until he got this job to me speaks of a lack of sincerity because being sincere me usually means you do something when you're not supposed to do it. You know, like if, if I sit there and tell you, if I offend you, uh, James, and after I offend you, I'm like, yeah, James, I offend you. That's one thing. But even before, if I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm doing something, I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Let me adjust this right away. I felt like that's being more sincere. So I had a really big issue with him being the judge, jury, and executioner of sincerity. Like, I, I wonder, will he look at someone kneeling? And just, I don't know if that's a sincere kneel right there, young man. Like, it's just, I'm angry. I, I was angry, to say the least. I was angry um, when he said that yesterday. And I'm happy that he is seemingly doing something. But to hear him talk about sincerity was felt like a slap in the face. 
Yeah, I exactly. Like who who why is he in charge of this? Why is uh why do they have to meet his uh, his rubric for this? And you know, this is cynical, but I, I feel like it's not gonna be an issue because Tim Anderson hits three thirty. Right. Right. <laughs> He, he's not going to question a thing Tim Anderson does because Tim Anderson is like that guy on the team now. Like the question is how he would handle it back in 2017 when this was first popping off and, you know, Maxwell has put himself on the limb. Bruce Maxwell was a backup catcher who was kind of up and down from triple A. Bruce Maxwell was really putting his career on the line. And sure enough, it did not go well for him. It's about mm -hmm. whether or not it's not about whether or not you can, uh, you know, bring yourself to this level of, I respect the sincerity of this guy who's a uh, all-star caliber player on my team and I'm not going to mess this thing up. It's whether or not you're fostering an environment where guys who don't have this, you know, built-in level of, you know, standing as a leader of the team, uh, you know, feel like they have to kind of walk on eggshells. And if you're, are, if you're establishing this idea that, you know, the guy who's your direct supervisor not only is, you know, in charge of you going up or down necessarily, but also can be the arbiter of whether or not your protest is legit or whether or not the, uh, you know, difficulties or the racism you're facing in everyday life that you want to give a voice to um, is, is worthy of being publicly spoken. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, the term gets used a lot, but that's problematic. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Please. That David show here with James speaking. James, let me ask you this. And speaking of the players, but I want to go to management, particularly Jerry. Do you do you think at all that Jerry factored in the Afro component of this team when hiring uh, Tony LaRusso or it, it, it didn't really matter? He was going to do what he wants to do. Um, I would think that maybe. I would imagine he's aware of it, but I would imagine that you know, he's probably heard the same anecdotes that I'm diving into now of, you know, times that Tony Rusa has had great relationships with uh, black players or Tony Rusa has, you know, on certain anecdotes gone, um, you know, and, and put himself on the line to try to uh, advocate for players who are facing, you know, racial, you know, being blackballed like Bruce Maxwell. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of these standalone uh, you know, anecdotes of him, you know, acting equitably that he would say like, well, this guy, um, you know, he probably put it maybe the way that Tony put it was like, he doesn't have a racist bone in his body, which, you know, sure. Great. But I always feel like a lot, you know, misses the point a little bit. It's not about whether or not you are an active avowed intentional racist. It's about whether or not you have blind spots or you have, you know, not complete, uh, cultural seven sensitivity or awareness where you're not you're missing things or you're making people feel like they can't air things. You know, there's, there's, there's a whole level of uh, gaps in management and also just interacting and understanding and showing empathy to people that uh, exist between being yes, a racist and not a racist that there's, there's still a, uh, you know, the count for. So I, I'm glad he's not a, you know, avowed racist. Like that's great, but <laughs> the standards, the standards are always going to be a little bit, uh, you know, yeah, higher. And, yeah. and, you know, it's, it's not 1960 anymore. We can't, we're not just, we're looking, we're calling for more for, for allies at that point. And I think he's aware of that, but also I, I, I would say the, the judgment is that he's getting there. Not that he's someone he's who there. I don't think he has immediately on day one, the level of cultural awareness that Rick Renneria had, uh, you know, on his last day uh, in this job. So I, I think that's a, a gap they'll be filling over time. And, you know, that that's something to work through over the course of a season where you're expecting big things. It's, it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, I never sick the dog on a black person or a, a fire hose on anyone. Like, oh, well, you are a good guy if you didn't do that. Uh, look, I want to speak to and then kind of get out of the negativity of it to a certain degree. But the tone deafness, and I don't put this on Jerry, and I mean, I, on Kenny and, and on Rick, but the tone deafness of uh, Jerry Reinsdorf, because who would have thought the entire city for the most part? Like, you really don't hear a lot of positivity coming out of this. And this is for this is from a guy that I think Sox fans, if it in the 90s, we would have we wanted him back. Like this was like I think how I'm not that old to the point where I remember Tony La Russa coaching the White Sox. All right. But when I found out that he was a White Sox manager, I was like, wow, we, we got rid of Tony La Russa. Uh, but, but when you see it now and, and that the whole city is basically like, nah, get out of here, son. 
Uh, what, what do you think about the tone deficit says about Jerry Reinsdorf and the fact that I, I won't say this was a marketing blunder because really it's going to depend on wins and losses, but still it, it definitely didn't come off right. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's, it's not the age, uh, you know, per se, when you talk about bringing back in the nineties, I think you could have, you know, after 2011, you let go of Ozzy Gee and you hired Robin Ventura. If they had hired Tony La Russa, uh, retired in 2011, right after winning a World Series. If they had hired Tony La Russa in 2011 I or that. 2012, you'd be like, all right, we just they just hired a, a World Series uh, you know, winning manager. Uh, he clearly can still do it. We just saw him do it. And I, yeah, he's 76. Yeah, he's the oldest manager in the league. And, and yeah, this is just seems like it's somebody who's been, you know, Jerry's friend and all like that. And I, I think, you know, even Rick Hahn, when he, in the press conference where they fired Rick Renner, had talked about, how you know the perception that the White Sox have been too insular and too much of just kind of bringing in their own people and, and uh, you know people they have close ties to and not searching the league for the best candidate. How that's a you know a good criticism that he agreed with and wanted to you know basically push against. And so yeah, I, I would say that this probably speak to Jerry Reinsdorf well not really caring about that criticism too much. He's not really caring about the public perception of it too much. Um, but I would say. It's not the age necessarily because I don't think, you know, we just watched seventy-one-year-old Dusty Baker get with a game within going to the World Series. You know, Joe Madden is sixty-six, and you know, people don't really slam on him too much uh, at this point, at least because he came in through very, uh, you know, analytically-minded organizations for being age uh, for for being uh, aware of it. It's not so much that he's old; it's that it's the gap to me. It's that this is not someone who's been necessarily. Uh, connected with the way that the the game has changed since 2011, and and really it's changed a lot. You watch it change very rapidly year to year. Uh, that you know things that we probably we watched the game for 2011 and how they manage bullpens and how they manage starters. Yeah, Tony Russo was at the forefront of you know bullpenning and a lot of modern strategies at the time. But things have changed really dramatically since. And if we watch the you know game from that World Series, so their claim would be that as much as we didn't see it. He's been very active in these kind of front office advisory roles that we probably thought as being cushy jobs where he's not really tied in. And, and really, he's more ready to jump back into the way baseball is right now um, than we realize. But yeah, from a marketing standpoint, it doesn't it's it's there's not a connection at all that 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 kind of Hall of Fame resume that he has a very impressive three World Series uh, championships. It does not convey as something that's immediately relevant to this time because we have not seen him involved in baseball these nine years. We haven't seen him kind of continue to evolve alongside the game the way we've seen somebody like Dusty Baker or Joe Madden uh, clearly like deal with the the year to year evolutions of the sport and, and stay in stride. So it's a it's a big question mark that people have, and it's the reason why people are not thrilled instantly on announcing it. It's something he has to come in and disprove day one, not just the fans, but to a lot of players in that clubhouse. That David show right here. We have James Fegan from the Athletic. Follow him at JR Fegan discussing the Tony Russo hire by the White Sox. Um, listen, you brought up Insler and you asked a good question to Rick Hahn yesterday. Um, how did you feel when he said necessarily that he didn't look at Tony as being an Insler hire because that had been such a gap from when he was the, the White Sox manager to him coming back now? It seemed like a kind of a technicality type of explanation, and I, I get it, and I, I think it. He makes a point that they're not, they weren't promoting from within the way they did with, uh, you know, Rick Renneria. And it wasn't just, uh, you know, or, or Frank Menachino, the hitting coach last year, that it wasn't just kind of, uh, you know, kind of shuffling the cards that are already present. It was bringing in someone who was technically from outside and other organizations. I think, yeah, I get it. Uh, it's, it's, it's technically right. It's technically true. I can't say that's wrong. Um, I think what people wanted from this and what I, you know, what was the other part of that question as far as, they talked about this as an opportunity that they were going to interview candidates from across the league. And by doing so, not only were they going to get the best candidate um, across the league and make a good hire, but they would learn something through that process about what other organizations do. What are the, you know, what's the tactical level that other organizations that are winning consistently are bringing. And that was going to be something that was going to be ferreted out from doing so many interviews. And, you know, from all indications, that's not something they really got the opportunity to do because once it was clear that there was mutual interest between, you know, ownership and Tony Arusa, at that point, the process becomes a little streamlined and how many interviews you're going to drag out with everybody when you kind of know uh, what ownership is going towards. And he said that they didn't want to lead people on. 
So that makes it sound like that opportunity to learn stuff kind of went a little bit by the boards. So I think that's, that's disappointing. I think people should be discouraged a little bit by that. I think very much they have a strong roster core where they can come in and, and, and Tony could show us all a little thing about how much he's been paying attention over the last nine years and they could win. But that still doesn't mean that that opportunity that they had to really maybe learn stuff from the rest of the league in a way that you don't get to because you don't get to call up a rival GMs and say like, hey, uh, you know, what's your you know pitching development strategy the way you do in interviews when you're offering somebody a job? It's, it, that opportunity went by the boards and they can't really get that back. James, what are some of the pros as far as on the field that you've heard about this hire? Like, what are some of the things around the league people are saying and some of the negatives that you're hearing? This is a smart guy. Like, this is a guy who was – he won three uh, World Series for a reason. This is somebody who was always technically very progressive. This was somebody who was always very pro-information during his time. This was always somebody who was on the cutting edge. I wrote a story, like, last month uh, about 40 years uh, – is about uh, basically – early 80s, 1983 White Sox is like near the end of it, was that uh, they had this researcher come out and he was did basically the first biomechanical analysis ever done. It was like, you know, this very old school setup of trying to do it. Now they do it with very digital cameras and TrackMan and StatCast and all that. But he was trying to get biomechanical data about pitching. And that was when Tony Arusa and Dave Duncan were basically in charge of the White Sox. And they were all about it. And they were ahead of the game and they were all about trying to incorporate it into how they managed. And that's always been them. They've always been trying to get the most modern data uh, and, and involved into their analysis. These are forward-thinking guys, and they always have been. So it's not like he's going to come in and just be rejecting of, of everything because he just had one moment in time where he understood the game and he never moved up beyond it. He's always been a progressive dude. At the same time, he's going to have to catch up. And you know, you know, for the longest time, and the reason the White Sox won a won a World Series and why they had a lot of great pitching. Uh, you know, over the last, you know, up until maybe the rebuild, uh, was Don Cooper was ahead of the game. Uh, he was very forward thinking dude about biomechanics, but it's hard to be ahead of the game for your whole career. That's not usually how it goes. Usually you're ahead of the game for a little bit, you're with the game for a little bit, and then you get behind and then you get fired or you retire and that's yeah. the end of your career. That's how normally things go. It's hard to basically outpace the world for your whole life. So I think that's a, that'd be a major challenge for him to kind of, um, catch up and i feel like maybe one of the downsides of the last four or five years of the white Sox was that they were trying to catch up in a lot of respects i mean chris gets i think has done a great job as player development director and you know their minor leagues but when chris gets came in and i want to say right before the 2017 season basically what they were doing was doing a lot of trying to catch up to what play uh teams like the rays and astros were doing for player development or the dodgers so that's not the position you want to be in is trying to catch up. You want to be with guys who are uh, at, at the forefront. I think Tony would argue that he's been, you know, in step uh, yeah. while he's been uh, involved in front offices with a couple different teams. He won a ring with uh, Boston, but, uh, you know, that, that's an unanswered question, whether or not you're getting somebody who is going to spend a lot of his first or, you know, one or two years or how long, however long his uh, tenure winds up being, kind of getting into stride with what's going on in baseball. Um, you can prove us wrong. I'm ready, willing, and waiting to, to be proven wrong, but I, I think that's a question that everyone that's valid for people coming in uh, to see where he's at with that. James Fegan on here talking about the White Sox. Look, let me ask you this. What happens if there is a Kevin Cash situation and the front office basically tells uh, Tony they want this rotation of this guy in the lineup and Tony gets goes across it? Of course it can happen once, but consistently. And it's, it's funny because I always think about Jerry Jones with the Cowboys and how in some situations, he's he's the, the end all be all. The coach kind of doesn't matter because you can circumvent the coach and go to Jerry. And it's the same with this Jerry now. Uh, like, what 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 do you think Rick Hahn is going to do in this situation, especially since his name is much ballyhooed now in the MLB? You know, I, I the perception, or at least the the understanding I had, is that among the league, the White Sox front office, in terms of in game strategy and in game tactics they were always a bit more hands-off with the manager, uh, at least during, you know, I've covered them since 2017 full-time. Um, I probably can't really speak to how they manage Robin Ventura. <laughs> but uh, they were always a bit more, you know, we talk about things, we have meetings post-game about why he did what, you know, we talk about what's the best position to put certain players in and whatnot. You know, there's a lot of front office managerial communication. 
But as far as what he's going to do and his ability to adjust mid-game, we're going to give him the leeway. We hired him for his baseball instincts. We're going to uh, you know, allow him the latitude to use that. Uh, you know, as Tony put it yesterday, the observational analytics, they, they let that, they're going to let that run there. And I think when you bring in a Tony Larusa, you know, frankly, as a strong personality, I, I don't know how much you have a choice to really rein him in, but I imagine it's not a big transition away from what they're already doing to kind of let him run. Now, whether or not how the debates will go about the best use of guy. I don't know what, you know, LaRusso will make of LOA Menace's defense and left because very much that was a message of the front offices that we're committed to this, you know, hell or high water, and we're going to see high water a lot. Um, I, I don't know how that kind of thing is going to go or, or how much they're going to be committed to a certain guy. The front office says, we believe he's a starter. He's going to get chances of rotation. Live with it. You know, that's obviously their approach to Dylan Cease, that they kind of weathered his control problems this year. We remains to be seen how that will go um, in, in terms of dealing that with management. But this is not like the Rays just hired Tony Russa and they're used to giving their manager a script uh, about how a certain pitcher is going to be used and how long he's going to go. And Tony Russa is going to throw the notes out the window. I don't, I don't think it's not that type of like fish out of water situation. I think they should be able to, they're an organization already prepared to kind of give their manager control of the game. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, definitely a stronger personality and, and someone who's can say like, you know, I know how to run a game. I know how to win a world series a bit more than maybe their last manager in terms of the relationship they have. But I, I don't see it as a huge issue necessarily. Good, good, real, really good. Look, so have you heard anything about how they're going to fill out his staff? Is there any inkling about anybody in, inside of the, the farm system that they may bring up to add to the staff or perhaps who the pitching coach may be? I, I know we know it's not going to be Duncan. Uh, thank goodness we're not going that far back but have you heard anything uh just not super specific just that um it might be more internal uh than you know it might be it would have been maybe if they had hired hinch or you know hired someone from an organization and we're trying to be all about how that organization other organization did things it it, it seems like with this manager you can and, and i can certainly understand the inclination of let's keep around some elements uh, of guys who have, you know, helped this good clubhouse atmosphere we already have. Um, you know, Joe McEwing would played under La Russa. They would have a good relationship. I would, I would think that's not necessarily that, you know, La Russa's first thing is get rid of Joe McEwing. I, I can't imagine anyone feeling that way towards Joe McEwing. He's a very nice guy, but I, 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 would, I could see him sticking around very easily. You know, Nick Capra has been basically a White Sox lifer for, for decades. And it was someone that he was brought, onto the major league staff because he had been the PD guy previously and had this relationship with all the prospects they're bringing up. So that's something that could, you know, could stick around. Um, Daryl Boston has a similarly, similarly long standing uh, with the organization, obviously uh, you know, the hitting was very successful last year. So I don't know if you necessarily would break up with Menachino and uh cool ball. Tony La Russa himself specifically name dropped Kurt Hasler and saying, we're pretty good there with our bullpen coach. So maybe we only need to fill one role pitching wise. So that seems like a pretty good sign for him. Um, they have strong internal candidates for pitching uh, coach. I spent the last four years hearing, you know, Matt Zaleski, our minor league, one of their minor league pitching coaches, who's going to be AAA this year if they, you know, if there had been a AAA season. Matt Zaleski is, you know, absolutely critical in Jonathan Seaver becoming a prospect and Jimmy Lambert becoming a prospect. Uh, Dylan Cease's breakout year happened under him. Everett Tiford, their pitching coordinator, countless. Uh, Countless pitching prospects have told me, Tief so, showed me this on the data. If I throw my four seam up here, if I throw a curveball here, it works out better. Now I'm throwing that, and now I'm striking everybody out. They have so many development success stories over to, under those two guys where I would say either one of them, if they added them, you should be encouraged by that guy being the pitching coach because that guy has had a ton of success already with the players they'd be inheriting who would be part of that pitching staff. So they definitely could do that very easily, and given the fact that everyone's expecting budgets to be kind of, uh, you know, tight and you've already now just hired a hall of fame manager. Yeah. I think they have, they have very viable routes if they kind of stick internal. Um, but yeah, it remains to be seen. There wasn't a super firm commitment and there, you know, there's time yet to kind of search that out, especially with not many, you know, coaching staff openings across baseball, uh, really. So they, they could search a little bit if they wanted to, but I would, I would suspect internal is where they'll lean. 
James, real quick on the side note, you brought up Coop being ahead of the game at one point, then the game catching him and passing him by. When it comes to someone, especially just to say as great as Cooper was, Don Cooper, is he in charge totally as far as how they take care of the minor league pitchers or he just adds in his input to it? I always really wanted to know that question, especially I would say over the last three or four years. You know, when I was covering Cooper, I would say that we spent a lot of time talking about how he was really, you know, making an effort to incorporate the advanced data into his uh, his work. You know, I had a conversation with Lucas Giolito near the end of last year. He was talking about, like, you know, everything's kind of night and day with our major league prep from 2018 and 2019. How there's so much, you know, high-speed video they're looking at that season that I had not looked at the season before. How so much, like... You know, you saw uh, Kurt Hassler dragging out the rap Soto to every bullpen side session uh, so they could track it and log it uh, starting in 2019. So there's a lot of efforts to kind of incorporate it. But I would say from what I largely saw, it was no longer a situation where it was top down or running, but it was more like, you know, Coop developed a rapport. He was talking with every pitching prospect. He was getting a sense of what they're working on, but it was very much a lot of, um, you know, Tiford and Zaleski leading uh, what they're doing and, and leading some of the data-minded changes that were in their arsenal that was leading to a lot of these guys breaking out. So it wasn't it wasn't like he Coop was walled off at any point, but it wasn't like you know Coop had a list of every pitch in the organization and said they should do it and then gave instructions to everybody either. It was no longer that kind of top-down approach. Okay, because I, I definitely had that question for a long time. I appreciate you answering it. Look, I read an article of yours maybe two to three weeks ago. And it was about A.J. Hinch. And I was an A.J. Hinch, Hinch guy, but it was good to see you go at the fact that don't take the cheating lightly. I, I did like to read that. So where were you at if A.J. Hinch would have been hired by the White Sox? But also, did the White Sox do themselves a disservice by not keeping him away from the Tigers since we all knew Tony wasn't going to end up with the Tigers if he didn't get the White Sox job? I mean, well, how do you keep him away from the Tigers other than by hiring him, I guess? You hire him. <laughs> you bring him in, James. I thought... You know, fundamentally, A.J. Hinch has a lot of strengths as a manager. I don't think it's just like he was a bad manager, but they cheated, so they won the World Series. Uh, he, he's always he's someone who's worked in the front office and managed. He has a lot of uh, ability to kind of um, communicate ideas from the front office to the players. Um, he is very data conscious. He is very, um, you know, kind of steady in his leadership and all that. But I didn't think... I didn't think it was purely an issue of, and I thought he'd be a good hire. I would probably write about how, you know, it's, you know, an upgrade and, you know, someone with playoff experience. Um, but I didn't think that it should be literally, you, you should view the cheating as, well, if you can just get over your kind of ethical concerns, this is a great manager. And they're, you know, it, it's just about you being kind of squeamish uh, the, about the way baseball is conducted in, in 2020. I didn't think it was that. This is a mark on his resume, not merely because of ethical concerns, and maybe ethical concerns is why he wasn't actually, you know, interviewed uh, yeah. that Reinsdorf had. But it's an it's demerit on his ability to lead a team because if you believe this narrative that he's merely didn't stop the cheating, that he was not the architect, that what you're buying into is a narrative where this horribly unethical thing is going on. And the guy who's literally in charge is powerless to stop it. So what is that saying about his ability to lead, to lead a clubhouse? And what is that saying about, you know, the respect that he has from his players if basically they can just cheat at an unprecedented level <laughs> and he's like, oh, ugh, if only there was something I could do, me, the guy in charge. I thought that was something that, you know, it's, <laughs> you'd seriously need to answer for and, uh, you know, show that he had improved upon going forward. So I didn't think it was totally just like a slam dunk uh, with no reservations. I, I still think that, you know, people would be right to be encouraged if he was here as a manager. I think the Tigers probably had a pretty good manager. Uh, count me as extremely bearish on the level of talent the Tigers had. Right. Um, I don't think they're going to win the World Series and make the playoffs next year, even though they have a good manager. You know, A.J. Hinch is not going to hit uh, <laughs> in the middle of that lineup. But yeah, I, I Disservice is probably, I would say, it's not like they had to hire AJ Hinch. And if they had, unless they did that, the managing search is a failure. The managing search is deserving criticism because they've made an extremely out of the box hire who has to answer a lot of questions to show that he's still qualified for this position. I think if they had hired, like, you know, 
they had hired like the, the bench coach from the Tampa Bay Rays, Matt Quattraro or something like that. And they had said, we interviewed everybody and this guy is great and he's a great candidate. He's forward thinking he's going to connect with our clubhouse. I wouldn't be writing like, man, these guys sure screwed up. They didn't hire AJ Hinch. I would think like, man, it seems like they had a really thorough process and they hired their best guy. Um, I think it's hard to know from a public standpoint who really the best managing the coaching standpoints are. So much of their work comes from behind closed doors and we get very locked in on a certain number of names that we know have had success. And you know, maybe that's why, you know, someone like Tony Roos is getting hired just because like once you see someone win a world series, you assume that there's this unique special quality that can not be replicated to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I think more of, I, you probably want to see a really good and really thorough process here. And that's where the disappointment comes from more or less than a, did they hire AJ Hinch a yes or no. And you know, that's the only way they could have had a successful, uh, you know, uh, manager hiring spree. I know it's not an apples to apples comparison, but could we use the same logic on Tony La Russa with the Bash brothers? Um, yeah, I, I would to keep say a so. needle out of somebody's backside. I know he can't just jump in between that, but still he was in charge of that. And he basically said he didn't know anything about it for the most part. Right. I would say I'm probably less learned on that. Uh, the specifics on that, but yeah, I, I would say it's a question mark. It's not a perfectly clean resume by any means. Uh, I would also say that I talked to players in the White Sox clubhouse in February who had all these arguments about how, what the Astros did was worse than that. How they mm. would, you know, had a ton of pitchers who said, I'd rather, you know, face, give give me the most roided out dude in the world and put him in the box against me. If he doesn't know what's coming, I'd be in a right. better situation than some guy who knows every pitch and about the throw. So I, I, I think there's a reason to hold that 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 scandal in a, a little bit higher regard. But yeah, I, I think that's a valid point. Listen, uh, Bruce Bochy was broken out that he was a sec second option from Bob Nightingale. Uh, would you prefer Bruce Bochy or was, was Tony LaRusso decent enough, even though I'm sure you would have went Bruce Bochy, but I have to ask you the question. Uh, I would say I would, I think people would have responded more positively to that. And, and part of it is um, that would seem like one, you would not have necessarily the, the feeling of cronyism that, you know, this is somebody who was just tight with ownership and that's why he got hired. And while I would say Bruce Bochy kind of resigned or retired from the Giants because it was a more graceful exit the, because he was maybe not necessarily, you know, uh, kismet with the new Giants front office, which is very forward thinking with Farhan uh, Zahidi. And maybe that should tell you a little something, but <laughs> it's a shorter gap from him being in baseball and having success in baseball than, you know, have with LaRusa. So the biggest question we have is, you know, this is somebody who's obviously had a success. This is someone who really knows the game. This is someone who's been a great tactician in the past. Is it still applicable now, nine years later, you're talking about somebody with a, you know, less of a, a, a cliff that he has to kind of navigate to show that he's still on top of his game. So, yeah, it would have been a little bit better. It had been, you know, kind of a similar hire, but it, it would take a, a, a smaller leap of faith. All right, a few more questions. I'm going to let you out of here. I know you got something to do. Uh, James speaking here with that David show. Look, you always do this fabulous article, this super, super deep dive on everybody in the Sox system. Like, if you're a real Sox guy, you love it. Like, I love to take my time and read through it. How are you going to execute that during the pandemic and with no minor league season so far? It's hard. I mean, I feel pretty disconnected from, um, you know, the system. And, I, you know, some of the guys – in this system, you know, White Sox personnel, I haven't seen them play all, all year. Uh, you know, I, I, I do have a plans to get Chris Getz on the phone uh, a week or two about instructional league because I've gotten at least a month of action of some guys on the field that, you know, really have just been participating in Zoom calls and stuff like that uh, of, of recent. But, um, yeah, it, it's definitely been hard. It's, it's also like maybe when, you know, the team is losing 100 games in 2018 – everybody wants to know what's going on in, in low A and high A. And so it's a little bit of switch in emphasis. Now that Louis Robert is here in Chicago, there's not as many Louis Robert tall tales to talk about in Birmingham as there were. I remember like, uh, you know, in 2019, there was like some stretch um, where the White Sox won like five games in a row where they overtook like Cleveland uh, for second place for a hot minute and they were like 500. And I was down in Birmingham watching Louis Robert and I had a bunch of messages from fans like, what are you doing up here? Like that, why aren't you in Chicago writing about this is the best baseball the White Sox have played in a week? 
or years. Uh, this is the best week of baseball they played in years. Why are you down here in Birmingham? I was like, dang, this has been <laughs> this has been all I've been doing the last three years is you know covering prospects, You're telling me no one cares about Dane Dunning anymore. <laughs> Man. <laughs> so there, there was a sense in 2019 that you know maybe this incredibly deep dive every year and trying to cover every prospect that that lifetime was a little bit coming, coming to, to an end. end. Okay. okay. Uh, so okay, I, got it, you. I don't know if we're going to go quite as deep as we have in years past, but yeah, I'm going to try to continue to keep track on that. I, I've definitely heard a lot about instructional league. Um, Matt Thompson, the second round pick, uh, basically the, that last year's draft 2019, the two high schoolers, Matt Thompson, and Andrew Dalquist, that uh, they kind of went over slot on hearing really good things about both of them. Really mm-hmm. a lot of confidence of those guys. They really bet what I like that they did was that there was it was a bad year for college pitching that draft. You know, the, the White Sox have been very in love with college starters. Carlos Redone, uh, Carson Fulmer, uh, Chris Sale. Guys who were kind of wacky and, mm-hmm. you know, wasn't sure if their command was going to really hold up. And, you know, two out of three right. turned out it didn't really work. But they had these elite college numbers that really gave you confidence that, like, all right, we, we can make it work. We can, we, we can shape them up. And so without that kind of temptation – they said, like, let's just look for guys, you know, obviously they're going to be high school, they're going to be far away. They're, they're not going to be like, you know, somebody who rushed through the minor league system in a year. Let's get some premium athletes, somebody who can repeat their delivery, who has uh, the ability to kind of, um, you know, project some velocity on their frame. And we'll, we'll be, we have a development system that we're confident we can bring them along. And so that's the investment they made with those two guys. And, you know, they made with, you know, Jared Kelly uh, as well this year, though. So, that's a very much a different kind of frame. Uh, you know, I don't have as much confidence there, uh, but it it seems like things have gone really well in that direction in terms of, of those two guys. So those would be names I would remember uh, if you're hunting prospects is Matt Thompson and, and Andrew Dalkus because I heard a couple really solid reports on them uh, from Instructional League this month. Listen, now that Tony has a job, you would think even with the pandemic that Jerry isn't going to let his boy uh, fail. He's going to give him everything he needs to succeed. So I would think now that we're going to add a little cash to this and what guys do you think they should go out there? Are we Stroman guys because Trevor Bauer is just too far gone? Like what What are the guys real quick that you think they need to uh, try to bring in to fill out this roster? I mean, who I think they need, I think if – I think you're who, who do you think they'll go get? I guess is the question. I should yeah, because I think like priority number one of the bullet um, is right field. Like I can talk myself into a lot of guys and they're starting pitching death and saying this guy's going to mature and be good. Like obviously, you know, we watched the playoff series and they needed a number three starter. Like you know, nobody's business. But you know, Kopech's coming back. Um, you know, Dane Dunning's going to get better. Um, you can if you talk yourself into it or say a new pitching coach is going to have success with Cease. Obviously, there's talent there. Um, you know, Ronaldo Lopez is still in the organization. You know, he, if you maybe maybe he wasn't real fully healthy all this year, and you can get him back to a better level. You got Jonathan Seaver, Jimmy Lambert coming up. There's options there. There's really no one in right field who I say is going to come up and grab this job. Uh, so I would say that you need to at least call George Springer's agent and figure out what the cost is there. That's the top guy in the market. Um, you know, there was no one banging trash cans this year and he, you know, still hit <laughs> extremely well. Uh, I would say off of previous, you know, their preferences, Jock Peterson is somebody who has always hit right handers and is coming off a down year. So he'll be even more inexpensive and, you know, showed well in the playoffs. He'd have confidence the talent is still there. You could take him, you could platoon him with Adam Engel and that would be kind of an inexpensive solution to that problem. I think people rightly, uh, want Michael Brantley, um, the White Sox have always uh, liked Brantley. Um, it wouldn't be perfect to stick him in right. He's really more of a left fielder. It's a below average throwing arm. He's getting older. Um, you know, Luis Robert would really be running uh, all season long, but I can certainly see it. The, the offense is, you know, very stable. He's a guy who makes contact and then hits for a little pop. It's not just like a one-dimensional thing. So I understand why people would be interested there. I would say if they're going to add the rotation, you mentioned Stroman and Bauer. Yeah, that's the level they need to shop for. They don't need another back end starter. They don't need a number four or five guy. They need another guy that they feel confident with, you know, handing a, a major start in the playoffs so that they're not running out the you know the crazy bullpen game in game three again. Whether or not they have the reserves there, whether or not their budget is going to be in the place when they don't know if they're going to have fans next season, it's really hard to say. Um, I think they're still waiting kind of for answers themselves to really know how much they can spend, but. Yeah, I, I think they should be aggressive if they really feel this is their year and they're hiring Russa for it. That you know, Stroman uh, 
or Bauer would be the uh, the type of guy that they, they should be hunting for. That's really the only person on that tier where you can hand that guy a playoff start and say, you know, we're not going to need to, you know, throw seven innings from the bullpen once this thing, you know, turns into a disaster or something like that. So I, there are little things they can add along with it in terms of uh, relief help um, or, you know, I, I think they're more or less just going to plug in Andrew Vaughn as far as first base DH, but I, I think to really meaningfully improve this team in a way that's, that's really useful, um, it's just really get a top tier right fielder starting pitcher. Mm. Listen, I'm getting you out of here. So what do you got coming out in the athletic and with the podcast? Um, trying to just dig more into La Russa and what kind of guy he is. I think there's a lot of uh, different accounts about um, whether or not he's somebody who really has the, the, the sensibility and mentality to, to, you know, perform this role well and, and lead people well. So I, I'm, I've got some calls out that uh, I think are going to turn into something uh, over this weekend about, you know, the way he's dealt with the, uh, you know, racial issues in the past that I think should turn up something, you know, um, failing that I have a, uh, I have a, it was something I worked on back when sports were shut down and I basically didn't write it all, all season, but I talked to Mike Cameron and Paul Canerco about getting traded for each other uh, back in 22 years ago. Oh. You know, it was a really, uh, there, there's some fun Mike Cameron quotes uh, about it. Mostly that, that game that he hit, four home runs against the White Sox. If you, <laughs> if you had any doubt that there was special motivation about trying to prove something to the White Sox that night, uh, he, he will remove those doubts from you. I look forward to that one. I, that's a good one. I look forward to that one. James, I always appreciate it. Please keep up the good work. Follow him at J.R. Feegan and also subscribe to The Athletic Chicago. James, keep it going, bro. All right. Thanks for having me. No doubt.